I'm so glad that you're with us today. If uh, I don't see anybody in here, they must have gone to Solomon's Porch, but I think we had about 18 Taiwanese who uh, were with us in Sunday school today and will be with us in worship as well. They are middle school students who are here for the uh, International Folk Festival, which is next weekend, and who will be in our middle schools teaching about their culture all next week. So we're glad um, to have them with us, and we're glad for the uh, Brandon Fisherman class for hosting them during the Sunday school hour. We have lots of prayer things going on uh, this week. Uh, we have our March prayer focus, which is on, uh, we're thinking about planting and, and then later on harvesting, not only physical planting and all, but spiritual planting. And you'll see on the back of your bulletin something about that, ways to direct our prayers this March. Wednesday night, we'll have a prayer walk starting at 530 just before church night supper, and we will walk around and circle the church. Uh, after church night supper, at 6.30, we will have our Ash Wednesday service with the imposition of ashes, and you are invited to all of these things. Then next Sunday night, prayer 109, 101, five sessions taught by uh, Bob will be starting. Now let's pray. Truly, Lord, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, kindle in us the fire of your love. Amen. Good morning. We're delighted to have Dixie McLean playing the organ for us today while... Cindy is in Florida attending the wedding of her nephew. We sing together number 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Join me in singing this. The last stanza says, Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Join me in singing.
seated. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now, as forgiven and reconciled people, let us greet one another in Christian love. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We continue our worship and we sing 452. My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Join me in singing.
Thank you, Quartet. I invite the ushers to come forward, and as they're coming forward, would you uh, sign on the friendship pads and give us uh, a record of your attendance here. I don't know how you handle giving money to the church. Because I work here, I, I just have it taken out of my salary. I just, um, then, I, then I know it's always done, and I don't have to think about it further. But I've gotten in a habit, and um, Dr. Allen, if you'll turn around just a minute, let me, of putting something in the plate as an example to children and grandchildren that see that going in there. It's important that we lead by example. And so I encourage all of you, if, if it's just a dollar, that's what mine was, a dollar going in there. But they see and they know that I'm having a part of the ministry of the church, even though I know and God knows that I do automatically. Let's pray. We are still before you. And we know that you are God. We know, too, that all that we have and all that we are belongs to you. So accept these gifts we give with a glad heart. In Jesus' name, amen.
Most any old stick could get up here and preach after that. You know, I, I'm glad Bob Moon's away today. <laughs> and I have this opportunity to be here and preach in my home church. <laughs> Grew up on this pew right here, one, two, three. Teased on the back end of number two. Moved here when I was four years old. Grew up in this church. Got married the first time at this altar, the second time over at the other one. Been blessed. My life enriched because it's been founded and grounded here. I can't tell you that I came because I wanted to. I came because Mary Norman said, get up and let's go. And I did. I'm glad I did. And one day I'll be laying right there. And after that, it's His glory. To tell you the truth, I'm kind of looking forward to it. 
I want to share with you this morning from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the 25th chapter, beginning with the 34th and reading through the 40th verses. And I'll ask you out of respect to our Lord to stand while I read to you from his word. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hunger, and fed thee, or gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, and naked, and clothed thee? When saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Will you be seated and bow your heads as we pray together? Lord, we lift out a small segment from the riches of your book. And I ask that you would guide us as we examine it more closely in order to see more fully the way of life that you're teaching and receive the courage with which to follow your direction. For we ask our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Some years ago I read an interesting little story. I don't even remember where it was, but Dr. Merton Rice in Detroit, Michigan, told this story from his pulpit. He said in the early days of the settlement out west, that his folks got up one morning going to work. Passing down an alleyway, they found the body of a man, obviously dead. The sheriff was called. He looked around. There was quite a bit of circumstantial evidence that pointed an accusing finger at one of the local citizens. He carried him down to the local morgue, tried as best he could, going through his clothing, no identification whatsoever. Asked around town, nobody had ever seen him before. Where did he come from? I don't know. He was just there. We didn't see him. And the first time anybody saw him, he was dead. They put him on display and invited the whole community and surrounding here. Come in, look at him. Can you identify him? No one could, but the circumstantial evidence pointed so conclusively to one of the local citizens that he was arrested, carried, put in prison. The trial came up. He had a pretty smart cookie for an attorney representing him who did not take an opportunity to defend him, really, but threw the burden of proof on the prosecuting attorney and said, you proved that this man was ever alive or else my client did not kill him. He was never alive. Prosecuting attorney went about the community, he went everywhere, he tried every way he could, could not find anybody who had ever seen him alive. So the conclusion was, according to the Defensive attorney, if he had never been alive, he could not have been killed by my client, therefore he's innocent. And on that flimsy defense, the man was released and exonerated. He had never been alive, so far as anybody could prove. And so Mr. X was buried in an unmarked grave, laid to rest. I'm here to say to you this morning that other than Mr. X, there are people who live in our community today who share life with us and yet leave no proof behind that they were ever here. Don't do anything. Don't help others. Just absorb a way of living and enjoy the amenities of the community where they live. No proof that they were ever here, really. 
For instance, go back to the book of Genesis, and there's a man listed back there that we know very little about by the name of Methuselah. All the Bible tells us about Methuselah was he lived to be 969 years of age, and he died. That's all the Bible tells us. That's all we know. I think I want more than that on my tombstone, that John lived a number of years, and he died. Surely we can do better than that. I read one of these little fillers in the newspaper some years ago, and it, it said the man gave his name in Wisconsin, who died. And when they chiseled on his tombstone his name, all they had to say about him was, he bowled a perfect game. Now, I didn't know what that was, so I inquired of somebody who knew something about bowling, and I asked what a perfect game was. They said, that's 300. Very few people ever accomplished that. This man did. Came to the end of his life, and all that they could say about him was he lived X number, of, and he bowled a perfect game. I want something more than that on my tombstone. We live in a community. We find our way, or my parents found a way for me at the tender age of four to this institution. It was here that I grew up. It was here that I was nurtured. It was here that I, I, I was formed into what I was to become. A lot of people in this community walk right by here. Never come in. See others come and receive something from it and find their life blessed by it, and yet they go right on and never claim any of that for themselves. You see, folks, all we've got to do is come and partake. And we fail to do it. Too many of us, like the story I heard of a Sunday school class, in the fall of the year, decided to have a Halloween costume party. Go have it at a member's home out in the edge of town. He started out there having gone and bought him a costume and dressed him like the devil. All you could see was a, a, a face sticking out. The whole total of his being was covered up other than that. And he went. Got his pitchfork out and painted it, spray painted it with some beautiful gold paint. Had it in the car in the drive passenger's seat beside him. Started out to the costume party, fully dressed as the devil. Thunderstorm came up. Rain so hard he couldn't see, and uh, he, he was afraid of having an accident. He saw a cleared place out here. He pulled into the parking lot. Ooh, it was the parking lot of a church, and there was a service going on. There were people inside and cars all out here. But I'm not going to bother them. They won't bother me. So he, he had parked in the parking lot. About to burn up. They got to have some air in here. Rolled the window. Couldn't do it. Rain was blowing in. Tried the other side. Same thing. Finally, he decided, well, I'm going to get out and run up there on the porch. I can get some fresh air, and I won't bother them, and they won't bother me. As he ran up the steps, the preacher was in the pulpit. He saw him. <laughs> he stopped out on the porch. The preacher didn't stop. He turned around and jumped head first out of a window behind the pulpit. <laughs> Folk up and down both sides of the aisle began to look around what's going on. They spotted this the, the devil out on the porch of their church. And one by one, they began to empty that sanctuary out the side windows, except for one dear lady who sat too long at the table and ate too much. She tried every window down this side and couldn't get out the single one of them. She came back down this side and couldn't squeeze the bulk of her body out of any of those windows either. So she finally just gathered herself together, walked up the aisle, went right back there and faced the devil. She said, look here, Mr. Devil, I've been a member of this church for 13 years, but I've been on your side all the time. <laughs> we got a lot of them like that. In the years of my ministry, I, I had some folks out there. I know whose side they want. They walk right by the church and never come in and receive any of that good stuff that's in here for them that'll help them in the living of their life. 
never support it. Never put anything into it, never get anything out of it. Watch youth grow up. And never encourage one to develop a talent. Never encourage one to, to be a man or to be a woman that they are capable of being. Never put any influence at all in any of the youth of their community. What a shame. What a shame. When I had two high schoolers living in the parsonage where I was serving, I discovered that on Sunday night after church, uh, the kids in the community, and we were having evening services then, and they were, the kids were gathering out at the Dairy Queen and just sitting around out there and talking, visiting with one another. And I got where well, I'd take Mama and the, the baby home and uh, the two teenagers in high school and I would go out to the Dairy Queen, take off my jacket and put it on the back seat, loosen my tie, sit on the fender of the car and talk to the young people. I'd ask them questions. They'd ask me questions. We had a good rapport going. Until one night I got real bold and I asked the crowd, what is there about my generation that you so dislike? Young lady over here, who incidentally was the valedictorian of the high school class that year, looked me straight in the eye and said, you old folks tell us one thing and you do another. And I said to my two high schoolers, get in the car, we got to go. I didn't have any comeback for that. She shot me right out of the saddle, and I knew it. Too many of us are not being the kind of people we need to be. Little Ronnie got off the school bus in front of a jiffy market in his neighborhood every afternoon after school. He'd go into jiffy market and get him a big orange drink and give him a change in pennies, please. Of course, the man did it and didn't pay attention to it, but it got to be such a regular thing, he got curious about what Ronald was doing. He'd go out the door and with his orange drink and his change and walk down beside the building and go around back. Nothing back there but woods and a little creek. So he said to his wife one day when Ronnie had been by and got his big orange drink and his uh, change in pennies, and I said, honey, would you watch the register for a few minutes? I, I, I got to see what's going on here. So we followed little Ronnie when he went around the building and down the side and back through the woods. And he got back and saw little Ronnie sitting down by a tree. And he stopped and watched, took note of what was going on. He was just sitting there. But he reached over and got that big orange drink and go, got him a big guzzle of it and sat it down got up and ran around the tree, came back, reached in the pocket, got a penny and threw it in the creek, sat back down. What in the world's going on? He repeated that process. And when he sat back down, the man from the Jiffy Market asked him, Son, Ronnie, son, what are you doing? Oh, nothing. Yes, you are too. I saw you. You, you. you take a drink, you get up and run around the tree, you take a penny, throw it away, sit back down. What are you doing? Oh, he said, I'm playing grown up. Playing grown up? Yeah. I'm drinking and running around and throwing my money away. I'm playing grown up. <laughs> Which is about the impression that a lot of them receive from us who are the adults. We ought to be the living example before them, but we are failing miserably. I would do a lot of things if I had the resources of John Doe. I've said that, you've said that. But the truth is, it's not true. I'd be doing exactly what I'm doing right now with the resources that I have, and you would too. Big bulky guy, muscles on top of his muscles. 
Little fellow looked at him in, in admiration. He said, if I was big and strong as you, I'd go up there in those mountains and find the biggest bear up there, and I'd kill him with my bare hands. Big fellow bear patiently listened to him, and then he said, Sonny boy, let me tell you something. There's some little bears up there too. But we don't think about that. We don't think about doing what we could be doing and should be doing. Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you came in and I was in prison and you came to me. When did we see you there? When you did it unto one of the least of these, you did it unto me. And we go down the path of life. We deal with the hungry. We deal with the thirsty. We deal with the naked. We deal with the sick. We deal with the imprisoned and all of the rest. But what are we really doing for our Lord? You do it, but let me tell you, do not look for instant gratification. Just do it for the Lord and move on down the pathway. Gratification comes sometimes later. I grew up with the image in my mind of Alaska. Got it out of National Geographic magazine, young man. Wanted to go, but... Finally realized that it was going to be after, be, would have to be after I retired. So after I retired, I began looking for a way to get to Alaska. I got in touch with a district superintendent of the Methodist Church up there. And, hey, I'm available. I'm retired. I'll come up there and do whatever. All I want is a place to stay in them. I'll be glad to fill somebody's pulpit while they're what, what. Nothing right now. Shortly, though, I got a phone call. Can you come? This is about to early part of May, can you come and be here the first Sunday in June? I've got a preacher that's leaving me. And I can't get another one until September. Would you come and fill in? I said, look out your door, that's my dust you see coming up the road. <laughs> Martha and I got busy. We packed the car. Two little South Georgia crackers never been outside, out of sight hardly of Lowndes County and drove to Alaska. Served as the interim pastor of the church up there for the summer of 92. Had an absolutely wonderful experience. Loved it. In the years afterwards, I guess I'd been back, I don't know, five, six times to visit. And one of the church members up there had been down to visit me twice. Love that country. Beautiful beyond description. Mama died and I remarried. Told Ella, I think this is what you I, I told her when I was trying to get her to marry me. I said, I'll take you to the Holy Land and I'll take you to Alaska. And I think that sold the bill. Anyway, we went to Alaska, flew. About three years ago, I announced to her in the early spring, I want to go to Alaska one more time, and I want to drive it. You what? I want to go to Alaska, and I want to drive it. Okay, if you're going, I'm going with you. And we had an absolutely a vacation of a lifetime. Going seven and a half weeks with no itinerary whatsoever, with one exception. I want to be in Anchorage one weekend so I can go to church with those people that I served several years ago. And I want to see my friends and worship with them. We did. Walked in church. 
They didn't have us just waiting there to greet us at the door like you have here. We walked in, picked up a bullet and looked around and stood in the back of the sanctuary and said, there's an empty pew right down there. Let's, let's go sit right down there. So she led the way and I followed. A couple in the pew just before the one where we were sitting spoke to us very cordially. I read her lips. Who are they? I don't know. They weren't here when I was. The woman was Oriental. The man was Caucasian. But they were delightful, just as cordial as they could have been. The sound of the echo of the benediction had not gotten out of the sanctuary before Eleanor grabbed that woman. She'll talk to anybody. And they quickly engaged in conversation. Lady said she was from South Korea. Said that uh, when the war broke out in Korea, initially, that she was in Japan. The family had moved to Japan. My father found work over there. But when the war broke out, they got sent back to Korea. Eleanor's brother, Bubba Strickland, you may you remember Bubba, sent his mama, he was over there in the army, and sent his mama a picture of little children sitting on the curb of a street, snow piled up behind them, about to freeze to death. You could look at that picture and see them shivering. And Bubba had compassion for them and sent the picture to his mama. And she turned the living room and dining room to a Salvation Army clothes closet and started calling her friends in Sunday school class and friends that she knew in churches and other churches. And they gathered up jackets and sweaters, anything to keep children warm. Illness said, My part was to fold sweaters. And when the jackets were folded, Mama got some little Christmas stockings, those little red knit, I mean red net Christmas stockings. And I put gum and candy and little toys in there and put them in the jacket pockets. That was my job. Never knew anything about it. They shipped them by the big boxes over to Bubba and bless his heart, he had connections and got them distributed to those who really needed them and got some stars in his crown for it I'm sure but Elna says I didn't know anything about Korea but just had a brother over there during the war And that I remember fit helping my mama with those jackets. And she said, that's all I know about South Korea. This lady, her newly acquired friend began to weep. Oh my goodness, she said, I, I've hit a sensitive nerve. I, I didn't mean to upset you. I'm sorry. I don't know what had happened, but I'm so sorry. So, no, 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 you don't understand. She said, I got one of those coats. And I know it because there was a little red stocking in the pocket. And it had gum and candy and some little toys. And I often wondered who sent it. And as they continued to literally puddle on the floor with their shared tears. And the elder said, and I wondered who got them. This is 55 plus years later that she found out what happened to an act of kindness and compassion on the part of an occupying soldier and his mama and his sister. And there she says, it made all the difference in the world. She later married, married a, met and married a soldier. 
a different time. But she's now grown. She met and married a soldier and came back to this country with him. And there he was, sitting in the congregation right behind us. Only the Lord could have done that. That's one of those God moments. You know he did it. Fifty-five plus years later. What are you doing? That's going to make a difference in anybody's life. What are you doing to help one along the pathway? What are you doing to help one of God's children survive today and look forward to tomorrow? You are alive when you're doing something for someone else. Jesus said your life consisted not of the abundance of things which you acquire. But it consists of the service that you render to others along the way. Are you alive? Prove it by the way you live. We're going to now close our service with Holy Communion as we do normally on the first Sunday. I want to say a couple of things before we do. Offering plates on each side, you know they're they're there for the hungry, the poor, the the naked, those who need help. This is our way of helping them. And having sat, as I did for 40 years as a pastor, I know about the constant flow through the church office. But yet, do not stay away if you're unprepared to make that offering. We're going to have communion by intention. We will give you a little piece of bread. The cup will be passed behind it. You dip your bread into the cup and then take it. You have received it as you come by, stationed on both sides under the direction of the ushers. Approach the servers with cupped hands. You are receiving, you are not taking. You are receiving. This is the body of Christ that was shed for you. You may pause here at the altar for prayer time, personal, if you like. If not, you have clear to return to your seat. Follow the direction of the ushers as you come to receive. Join us at the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. 
By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. <coughs> Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>